are so happy that we all get to do church together. We're a church family, but there are great opportunities where we can serve our community here in Franklin County. And this summer is jam packed with volunteer opportunities. And that means we need pretty much every one of you to at least help out when, with one or even more of these opportunities. So here are your opportunity chances. We've got the Rise Up Barbecue and Family Event coming up in June. We've got the Bay Day where we have the triathlon down at the, at the Bay. And we now have a new FCA, Fellowship of Christian Athletes Sports Camp for kids in our community. We need you all. Be listening and looking out for further details about each and every one of these events. But think about how you can really get out of these walls and get out and be Jesus in our community. And another way to volunteer are the nursery schedules are ready for this next quarter. So go find your schedules out in the lobby. And tonight, Dean Braxton is here. You don't have to volunteer at all. Just show up and enjoy what he has to say. Well, Leilani Estates. How many of you have heard of Leilani Estates? Some of you have, if you've been watching the news. Nobody had a month ago, I can promise you that. Before May 3rd, Leilani Estates uh, didn't mean anything. To those of us who go to church here, it just sounded like an estate that belonged to uh, Leilani King, but that wasn't what it was named after. <laughs> but Leilani Estates has become, for anybody who watches the news, the most well-known neighborhood in the entire United States. A month ago, it was a quiet little paradise, tucked away in the south, in the northeast corner of Hawaii. Um, it was a place where you could basically live off the grid, practically, or, in, or maybe completely. Uh, it was lush, tropical forest, little paved streets, little one-story houses, and uh, people were just living the dream there. They had no idea what was going on beneath their feet. But then on May 3rd, just this month, the ground literally split open. And if you've seen the images, uh, streets just developed cracks and steam and smoke and sulfur started coming up out of those cracks. People's yards split open. And then the lava came and the lava began to shoot up into the air. In some cases, 300 feet high, uh, the lava fountains. And of course, what, when the lava comes, the lava does what, it, what the lava wants to do. And it began to burn up the forest, move into people's yards. Uh, anybody see that picture of the Ford Mustang getting swallowed by the lava? None of you have? Yeah, you go home and Google Ford Mustang lava and you'll get to see it for yourself because uh, the battery didn't work so the guy couldn't get it started and um, now it is permanently encased in, uh, in Hawaiian lava. You go into that neighborhood now. Uh, lava is now threatening to take over the entire area. Poisonous gases are coming out of the ground. People say that the sound of the lava vents are like a jet fighter going in your backyard. The last highway to evacuate that entire area is under threat at this very moment. And the Hawaiian uh, 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 officials have actually positioned helicopters to go in and get the last holdouts. If the people, you know how it is, people don't want to leave. I'm not leaving, I'm going to be okay. Well, at some point, they won't be able literally to get out of their houses if this lava cuts that last road. For these people, the term terra firma, solid ground, will never mean the same thing as it does to you and me. Because the unthinkable happened. Uh, there, where they live, where they raise their kids, where they had their, we're going to have their, their barbecue uh, this maybe last night or tomorrow morning or tomorrow afternoon, that whole place suddenly doesn't exist anymore. And I imagine that the first Christians in Jerusalem must have felt something like that when their fledgling movement became the target of fierce opposition from their own religious leaders, from their own people. Uh, for a few short days or a few short weeks, this new movement with the good news about Jesus had become the talk of the town. If you take the book of Acts and you begin at the beginning, well, there aren't very many people who follow Jesus at the beginning. There are about 120. And they're in, gathered in this upper room. They're just a little tiny sect that has, has this new understanding of God and has actually experienced Jesus' presence after he rose from the dead. But nobody else is in on it. 
And then in one day, we're told 3,000 people come on board. 3,000 people are baptized. And the movement begins to just mushroom. And of course, you know how it is when something goes viral. Uh, people talk to other people. And then they bring their family. And they bring their friends. And pretty soon, this was the talk of the town. It was transformational. Every day, we're told, the Holy Spirit was working signs and wonders, miracles in people's lives. In chapter 3, we, we talked a week or two ago about the fact that a man who had been lame from birth, over 40 years old, was instantly cured there on the steps to the temple in front of everybody. And everybody knew who he was because they'd walked by him for decades. And this guy was a fixture. They'd watched him as a young man. They'd seen him grow old. And now all of a sudden, he was healed. So for these believers, you would have to say they were living the dream of being part of God's new creation. It was as if God had planted a paradise on top of the old, broken, crumbling structures of this world, and they were the first people to get to live in it. But now, all of a sudden, paradise is turning into the opposite. The ground is opening up underneath them. When Peter and John defended themselves for simply praying for healing for a lame man, that's all they did. When they defended themselves, they were thrown in jail. They were ordered to never again speak of Jesus of Nazareth. They were told to stop healing people. They were told to stop doing all the good things that God was doing. The threats came thick and fast, and they all knew full well where that would lead. After all, they'd seen what these same people had done to Jesus. And now it looked like after just a moment of sunshine, the dark clouds were coming back in. So it was time to sound a warning. And in Acts chapter 4, verse 23, Peter and John, they had just been released from the authorities and they come back to their group. And now we find out what you do when the chips are down. We find out what you do when things aren't going well, when you're facing opposition. We read, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and the elders had said to them. Talk about a watershed moment. Now we're going to find out What's going to happen? How will this movement respond? How will these believers respond now that there are threats, now that there's the possibility of imprisonment or confiscation of all that belongs to you, or your family being torn apart, or maybe people being put to death? Would they back down and abandon this newfound faith, just go back to the old way of doing things? Would they go underground? Or maybe just move, all, move out of town and just do their thing off in a quiet place? Or would they take a, their fight to the streets like other groups had done? Some of the groups in Jerusalem at that time were very militant. Uh, what we would consider, you know, basically uh, insurgent. Would they then take up arms and start to defend themselves to bring the kingdom of God? Or was there another way forward? You and I face that same question. Whenever we face opposition, or it may come in some small thing, just a, just a, a little interchange at home where, where all of a sudden we hit each other's, you know, hot, uh, sensitive spot and, and create a, 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 a moment of anxiety and anger and we suddenly realize that we're not on the same page. Uh, it may be something that unravels at work when you find that you're on the wrong side of the manager or, or that the people in your office have, have decided to make you the, the scapegoat for all their problems. Maybe the kid who faces bullying at school and, and uh, it just doesn't even want to get on the bus, doesn't even want to go. It may be that, and this happens, uh, you've been singled out simply because you are a follower of Jesus. Not because you go around with a 20-pound Bible on a baseball bat and whack people with it, but just because you have a faith. And people have figured that out. And, you know, time and time again, somebody will decide to see if they can take you down and uh, make you the butt of their jokes and their little snide comments and so on. And that can wear on you. Uh, that can make you want to feel, perhaps, like not showing up. Or maybe just sort of burying, putting your light under that basket that Jesus talked about. Or maybe even fighting back. We all face opposition. And scientists tell us that our brains, uh, when we face a threat, have a very, very uh, instinctual response. There's a part of our brains that is referred to as our animal brain. It's the part of our brain we share with our dogs and with our cats and with all the rest of the creatures that are in a, 
in a survival of the fittest mode all the time. Your animal brain, when you are under threat, is going to say, it's fight or flight. Either I'm going to stand and spit back and yell and make a big fuss, or I'm just going to get out of here. And each of us probably have a, a response that we sort of default to when we face opposition. Maybe you're one who just clams up and basically slinks away. Or, or maybe you're someone who, who uh, gives it right back. Somebody comes at you and you just have a word for it and you just want to go right at it right now. Well, is there another way? Well, rather than trying to fight this fight on their own, what these Christians did was make a direct appeal to the highest court possible. Now, rather than arguing, rather than trying to take matters into their own hands, they decided to go to the highest court in the universe. We read in the verse 24, when they heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. Sovereign Lord, they said, you made the heavens and the earth and the sea and everything in them. You see what they're doing? Instead of trying to rely on their own strength or their own ideas or their own wisdom or their own rightness or whatever, they are saying, let's go talk to our Father. Let's talk to the God who created everything. Now, let's not worry about this opposition over here, someone who's trying to basically uh, gain power over us or intimidate us or threaten us. Let's not worry about that. Let's go talk to the one who runs everything. You see, these early believers understood something that you and I need to understand. We are part of God's new creation. And his new creation is happening right on top of his old creation. So there's going to be friction between the two. When the new comes, the old is not always going to just say, oh, that's great, let's go there, let's do that. Those institutions and power structures and people who are invested in the old way of doing things are going to fight for their turf and they're going to be threatened when God comes and does a new thing, even if it's a very wonderful thing. It's kind of hard to imagine how anybody could be upset with a, a lame beggar being restored to walk around and being restored to a, a, a normal and healthy and productive life. And what would be wrong with this man saying, hey, God, I thank you for that and I thank you that you did it through your son Jesus. But you see, that new life and that new thing and that new creation called into question all of the other assumptions that everyone had who had power in that old way of doing things. So what these Christians did was they said, we're going to go to the creator who is creating this new world, who is making all this happen. And we're going to put this in his lap. Now in their prayer, they do an interesting thing. They quote their Bible. They quote an ancient psalm written by David. Psalm, actually Psalm uh, chapter, uh, Psalm 2, the second one in the book of Psalms. And so here we read what they said, beginning with verse 24. You spoke by the Holy Spirit through the mouth of your servant, our father David. And here's the psalm, two verses of it. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth rise up and the rulers band together against the Lord and against his anointed one. Literally, his Messiah, his Christ. Now, this is something David talked about. David was the anointed one at that time. He was the king. To be anointed meant that you were the king. They would literally take oil and pour it over the king's head as a sign of God pouring out his blessing and power over this person. So David was saying, look, I'm facing opposition. I'm getting this opposition from the nations and the peoples. And I'm bringing this to you. And they're saying, we're going to do the same thing David did. We're going to bring our problem to the king of kings, to the one who rules the world. So they say, here's this thing David said. And then they connect the dots between what David said and their situation. Now there's something very powerful about that. Because if you try to figure out your situation, just based on how you feel and who said what, you can create a pretty, pretty dark narrative in a hurry. You can create a story in which you end up feeling sorry for yourself. You can create a story in which you feel empowered to go out and be really nasty to other people. You can create a story of hopelessness. You can create a story of a false sense of pride. But they didn't do that. They connected their situation to what God had already said. They connected the dots. And listen to how they did it. Now here's what they say now. They've quoted this psalm and then they tell their story and link it to the psalm. Verse 27, 28. Indeed, they say, this is to God now. Herod and Pontius Pilate 
met together with the Gentiles, the nations, and the people of Israel in this city to conspire against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed. They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. In David's psalm, he talked about two groups, the nations and the peoples. Well, when the Christians put this together, they take David literally and they say the nations, well, that refers to the Gentiles. What Jewish people to this day call the goyim, the non-Jewish people. And of course, Pilate was their ruler, the one on hand representing the entire Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, through Pilate, were the ones that had the power to put Jesus on the cross. But then there's this other expression, the peoples. Now, the technical word, the term for Israel was that they were the people, the people of Israel. And they're represented by Herod, who was the nominal king of the Jewish people in Galilee. In fact, where Jesus lived. And so here you had a, a conspiracy between both the Jewish people of Jesus' time, in their leadership, that is to say, and the Roman authorities, which is exactly how the Gospels tell the story of Jesus being put to death. Remember, he was first of all arrested by the temple authorities. He was condemned to death by, a, by the highest Jewish court of the land. And then he was brought to Pilate for Pilate to actually give the death sentence because only Pilate could do that. It was a conspiracy that brought in the entire political and religious system of the time. It was as if the whole world in all of its power, came together to oppose Jesus. And they say, well, that's exactly what David was talking about. But then they say, but what those powers didn't know is that they were working your plan. You see what they say at the end of the verse? They did what your power and will had decided beforehand should happen. In the psalm, David goes on to say that God laughs at his opponents. Because their hostility plays right into his greater plan. And now these believers are saying, Okay, Lord, this is not a fun place to be. This is frightening. This is terrifying. We don't know what's next. We can see the ground cracking right open under our feet. And we don't know how long or how bad this will be. But you have a greater plan. You had a greater plan for David. When he was in the middle of his troubles. You had a greater plan for Jesus when he was arrested and taken to the cross. That was your way of bringing him to the place of defeating death and of defeating sin and of unleashing this new creation that we're experiencing. And no matter what these opponents do to us, they cannot subvert your plan. They cannot cancel out your plan. In fact, everything they do actually advances your plan. So look at how they finish their prayer. Verse 29 and 30. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. Stretch out your hand to heal and perform signs and wonders through the name of, our holy, of your holy servant, Jesus. <laughs> you see what they didn't say? They didn't say, now, Lord, smite our enemies. Give them what they're, what they're giving to us in double portion. And don't you know, break their jaws, break their bones. You know, don't let them sleep at night. Ruin their finances. No, he says, give us more boldness. Because your plan is dependable. Because you're in control. And so this opposition is simply showing that what you're doing is working. If there wasn't any opposition, then the world wouldn't be changing. And then really, you wouldn't be making this new creation. There was no effort here to back down. There's no bitter complaining or lamenting. Instead, they can see the opposition is proof that they're doing the right thing. So what they need right then is more of God's power, not less. Isn't that a beautiful response? In the face of this intense, even deadly opposition, instead of getting locked in on their enemies, <laughs> they say, God, we need more of you. And we need you to give us power to do more of what you're already doing. Because, God, you're the one that's on a roll, not them. You might say that they could see that the lava of hostility which was erupting from the ground 
was actually part of the renewing of a world, not its destruction. Any Hawaiian can tell you that without the volcanoes, there'd be no Hawaii. This is the, the great irony of living in Hawaii and of watching volcanoes erupt. And yeah, it's your house and it's your car and it's your livelihood that goes away and it's a terrible tragedy. But the fact is, there wouldn't be any island if there weren't volcanoes. And it's been interesting to talk, to, listen to some people from Hawaii talking about how they're actually glad that the volcano is erupting because there's more Hawaii now. As the lava goes into the ocean, it creates more island. And of course, it's been doing that for a long time. The current eruption, however much destruction it may cause, is only making the island bigger. It's actually creating a brand new place. Now, in answer to this prayer for power, Luke says, Acts 31, 4.31, that after they prayed, the place where they were meeting was shaken. They were filled with the Holy Spirit and spoke the word of God boldly. You see, the answer to this hostile opposition was a new Pentecost, was another filling of the Holy Spirit. The same Holy Spirit who had been poured out on the believers in that upper room on the Pentecost Sunday came again to refresh and refill them for new challenges. There's a lot to learn there for us. And because just because you had a great experience with God, perhaps at some point in your life, maybe on a retreat or on a convention or in your personal time or at some time when you were really searching, it doesn't mean that you're not going to need God to do something just as powerful or even more powerful at some point in the future. And when opposition comes, it's time for us to say, okay, God, we need more of you. And we're facing a bigger challenge than we faced before. We need even more of you to be here. An amazing thing happens to the black desert of a fresh lava flow once the molten rock has cooled. Just three months after the lava cools, blue-green algae, yep, the same stuff that we're fighting here in Vermont, blue-green algae begins to take root on that absolutely sterile, barren, rocky surface. And this was molten lava that was coming out of the ground, burning everything, destroying everything in its path. When it cools, there it sits under, the, under the, the big blue sky and the rain falls on it. And the first thing that's begun to grow there is blue-green algae, three months after the lava has cooled. Three months later, just three months later, ferns take root in all the little cracks in the lava. And if you ever go to Hawaii and see the lava flows, the fresher ones will have these little ferns that will be about maybe so tall, the whole strings of them growing out of the lava. And of course it doesn't stop there. After the, the ferns come mosses and lichens and little shrubs and eventually, uh, over time, that lava field is completely covered with soil and becomes a lush tropical paradise. And of course the fresh nutrients that have come up from underground only make the soil that much richer. You see, the lava is actually part of a greater plan. It's part of a recreation or a new creation happening in the place where, where the old world uh, once was. When you and I face opposition, it can feel like the ground has opened up beneath our feet and the hot lava is about to consume our world. Perhaps someone you know and perhaps someone you trusted has turned against you and is lashing out against you. Uh, perhaps Facebook or social media, other social media are lighting up with all sorts of things and people are sowing things about you and, and you don't even know whether you should even respond to them and how you would deal with that. Uh, perhaps it's just something going wrong in the family, in the family dynamics and, and uh, just people aren't getting along and there's stress and there's, there's turmoil and, and you just sort of feel like everything you work for is, is sort of slipping through your fingers. It may be, like I mentioned a few moments ago, that just because you're a Christian, you've been singled out, perhaps by family, perhaps by friends, uh, perhaps by people at work. And you're not quite sure how to respond to that. You know, how, what do you do with all of that? Well, that would be a time that I would encourage you to do what these first Christians did. And I want to describe what they did as working a power equation. And the power equation works like this. Opposition plus prayer equals power. Opposition plus prayer equals power. If you don't do the prayer, all you get is the opposition, and of course then you're just dealing with the negativity of the world in your own strength. 
But when you take that opposition and you do what these believers did and you bring it before God and you go, here, this is your thing, Lord. Give me more of you for this situation. God has an amazing way of changing how we see what's going on. Of changing how we see that person who's coming against us. Of changing how we see the whole dynamics. Well, he allows us to operate with his love, with his strength, with his grace, with his power. Never did these Christians in the book of Acts ever take up arms against their enemies, against those that opposed them. Never did they fight back. Never did they bushwhack their enemies in a dark alley somewhere, uh, even when their own people were being put to death. In fact, when one person by the name of Saul, who was later known as Paul, persecuted them, and then became a Christian, they welcomed him as a brother. It was a hard thing to do. But they could see that God had a bigger plan. A plan that would go all over that Roman Empire, would go all over not just the Western world, but the entire planet. And God would use a man of opposition to become the greatest spokesperson for the Christian faith. So you see, opposition plus prayer equals God's power. You can think for a moment right now about some situation in your life where you are facing opposition. Where you or what you believe in, what you stand for is facing opposition. You think of what's going on in our country with such bitter division between left and right, uh, between liberal, conservative, however you want to divide it. And we can see that simply fighting each other isn't really fixing anything. It's just sort of a perpetual stalemate. Kind of a political World War I that never ends. But what happens when Christians do this? When they see things that they don't agree with. And they hear voices that they don't agree with. And they say, Lord, I'm coming to you. How can I be a change agent in that situation? This isn't about winning and losing. This is about your new creation. That's how God changes his world. That's how God's going to change that situation that you're facing. That's how God's going to change how you see what's happening in your own life, in your family, in our country around us, in our world around us. Paul, again, that great opposer to the faith, who became its greatest advocate, wrote in Romans 8, 28. And we know that in all things, if you underline anything, there are some words to underline, huh? All things God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. Don't forget the purpose. The God's purpose is bigger than the opposition. In all things, God works for the good of those who love him and have been called according to his purpose. So when the ground opens up and the lava starts flowing, apply the power equation. Opposition plus prayer brings God's power. God's plan is infinitely bigger than the troubles we're facing. And his plan works for good. He's a good God. He's a good creator. He never made a bad plan. We're all part of that new creation. Can we bow our heads together? And I'm going to ask if our prayer team would come down. Worship team, come on up if you would, please. We just bless us with another song. But let's just take a moment to just do some work together here with our heads bowed. And I just encourage you to think of a place where um, you might be experiencing... Uh, that fight or flight response. Or maybe it's a place where someone you care about, a family member or a friend, is facing opposition, facing real troubles. And they don't just have to be the troubles that come from anger or, or misunderstanding. Uh, you know, opposition comes in many forms. We can feel a tremendous amount of, of, of hurt and pain when, when we lose the job or when we are facing that, that medical emergency that we don't have any strength for or any solution for. Whatever the opposition, wherever the lava is flowing into your backyard, let's just take a moment right now to say, Lord God, the God who created heaven and earth, I'm putting all of this in your hands because I believe you have a bigger plan, a plan for good and not for evil, a plan to... Bring me a hope and a future. A plan to make this situation brand new through your love and through your presence. 
Can we just pray that right into the situation right now? Lord, I just pray this into people's hearts as they deal with these situations in their lives. Lord, as we look at the state of our society and our country, Lord, drive us to our knees to put these things before you. Understand, Lord, that whoever wins an election and whoever gets to have the last say on the next piece of legislation isn't really the big purpose or the big plan. Your plan is the big plan that matters. And Father, we just give you thanks and we give you praise in Jesus' name. I want to encourage you uh, tonight. Dean Braxton is going to be with us. You saw the little announcement for that. Talk about opposition. Uh, Dean uh, died. An hour and 45 minutes, clinically dead. Signed off by his doctor. And uh, then God brought him back. And he's going to be sharing that story tonight. It's a, you know, for a lot of us, it's probably going to be one of those once-in-a-lifetime experiences of actually meeting somebody who wasn't here for an hour and 45 minutes and God sent back. And so this is not just something you're reading about in the book or watching a little YouTube clip on. Dean's going to be here, he and his wife, uh, at 7 o'clock tonight. And uh, the, uh, we're going to take a love offering for him, which will just help with his expenses. Uh, but he has a real deep burden for people who don't know Jesus yet because of what he experienced and of what the Lord Jesus said to him in that time that he was uh, in Jesus' presence. So uh, I know it's a busy weekend and uh, this was the time that uh, Dean was going to be here. Uh, so we're, he's actually in our Assembly of God Church in Rutland this morning. And he'll be up here this evening. Uh, and so if, it, uh, if you can make that work, uh, finish up the picnic and get down here by 7 o'clock and uh, we'll, we'll share in that uh, time together. I'm going to ask the ushers to come at this time. And uh, let's, um, let's stand together as, as we get ready to sing. And we're going to receive this building offering. And we really appreciate uh, your helping with the capital campaign. Uh, we'll be bringing you some big updates in the next couple of weeks. As uh, we basically signed off on just about everything at this point. And so we're going to be seeing big changes this summer. And can we bow our heads together? Father, we pray that you bless these these gifts that are given now to make this transformation of this space in which we, we worship you. Uh, we know, Lord, that we're only talking about physical things. But, Father, we, we thank you that we can trust you to meet these needs so that we can then be part of helping make a space where people find you, regardless of what kind of things are going on in their lives, that they'll discover the God with a greater plan. We give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. So we'll receive that offering and I'll turn things over to Martita.